Thanks for listening to Vermont Edition. I'm Andrea Lorian, one of the producers on the show, and what you're about to listen to has been edited for clarity and brevity. Thanks for listening, and enjoy. This is Vermont Edition. I'm Michaela Lefrac. It's no secret that Vermont's population trends gray. The median age in the state is 43.2, making it the third oldest state in the country, behind two other New England states, Maine and New Hampshire. Vermont's population is also getting older. By 2030, one in three Vermonters will be north of 60. For almost the past decade, more people have died in the state each year than were born. Today on the show, we're going to look at what this demographic shift actually means for Vermonters today. We'll be focusing our conversation on Essex County, the oldest county in the state. Today's show was inspired by work that's going on over at Seven Days. Reporter Colin Flanders has a recent cover story that takes a comprehensive look at Vermont's demographic shift. It's called Getting On. An aging population is transforming Vermont's schools, workplaces, and communities. Colin Flanders joins me in the studio now. Colin, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, Colin, at the top of your piece, you write, and I'm quoting here, these demographic shifts, while long fodder for political speeches, have never captured the public's attention, their implications vague and seemingly distant amid more immediate crises. Can you tell us more about why you think that this topic has, for so many years, really failed to capture the public's attention? Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of a virtue of how slow moving it is. I mean, uh, aging by nature is a pretty slow moving process. Um, Yet still, I think uh, we have been aging so rapidly, and I don't think a lot of people recognize that. And I I think, as I write there, that there are just so many other things to pay attention to. Uh, Put yourself in the shoes of lawmakers who on every other day are trying to put out fires or receiving requests for funding of uh, whatever system of the day is is struggling. And so I think it's just – it's a little hard to wrap your head around when you're sitting there day to day uh, contemplating your own aging about what that means for the broader society. But I think we are reaching a point where it is becoming a little hard to ignore. Uh, We are feeling the impacts across things like our declining school enrollments, the increased pressure on our health care system, everything, and our housing stock. I mean, we are constantly hearing about people who are stuck in their homes because they may not be able to age in place there, but there's nowhere else for them to go. And so across the board, I think we're getting to that tipping point where we really need to be starting to talk about this more. Mm. And speaking of tipping points, I don't know if you all planned this or not, but with the results of the town meeting day school budget votes last week, it had a lot of people talking in a way I haven't really heard before about statewide about what the state's aging population means specifically for for schools. I mean, the state has lost, what is it, about a thousand students in its public school system per year for the last two decades? Yeah, that's right. Um, and it's funny, if you go back and read through the archives, you'll see in the 90s, there was a conversation about whether our school population was getting too big uh, oh. for us to handle. There were schools that were uh, looking at uh overflowing classes. And and there was a a concern about whether we were able to handle that. Now, 30 years later, we are about 30,000 less students. uh, And we're seeing that impacts, uh, especially in rural areas where schools that might have had 100, 200 kids are now down to 50. I wrote in my story about uh, Greensboro, uh, Lakeview Elementary, they're down to 27 students. Um, And so I think the, the conversation that's going on with school districts right now is education spending is going up and continues to go up, and we need to become more efficient. I think a lot of school districts are thinking about how to do that. The quickest way, uh, in many cases, is to consolidate. And we've already been consolidating administratively through Act 46 for the last decade. But uh, I think the conversation about school closures is going to become more and more urgent. And we're already starting to hear that. Uh, Interestingly enough, though, on town meeting day, there were a couple votes about whether to close schools and they both came back no. Mm. So it's a really hard conversation. Yeah. Um, One of them happening in in Cabot, uh, I remember. Uh, Now, Colin, there's so much to to uh, th- pull out from your article, and I urge everyone who haven't, hasn't read it yet to to take a look. Um, but you go a bit into the the history of this trend and where where we could uh, kind of look back to in history uh, to see how we got to where we are today. Uh, what did you learn? Yeah, so this is. Um 
The one main thing is that Vermont grew pretty rapidly from the 1950s to 2000. Um, even though we did lag some of the other parts of the country, there were times where we were kind of on the leading edge of growth. Uh, we brought in uh, maybe two to 300,000 people in a pretty quick succession over the decades. And then we plateaued around 2000. And the other piece of that is birth rates. We have the nation's lowest birth rate, and that's only been declining. And as you mentioned, we sort of crossed that tipping point of 2015, where where we had more deaths for the first time than births, and that gulf is only widening. And so, I mean, pretty simply, if more people are dying than are being born, that means you're shrinking. And so the only way to offset that is by bringing people in. And Vermont has for years had a conversation about how do we keep people here and how do we attract people, especially families. Um, and over the last 20, 25 years, uh, that, it's been pretty stagnant. Now, uh, Colin, thinking about moments where um, Vermont's population was either growing or we thought it might be growing a little bit, uh, I think back to the pandemic uh, when there was this moment where it seemed like people were were really moving in to the state in a in a concerted way. Did did that inward migration have any lasting impact? Yeah, I think we're still trying to figure out exactly what the long term impact of that is, including how many of those people are going to stay for the long term. Uh, I I think we. We even know at seven days we've done reporting about uh, people who moved here and then moved uh, out of the state pretty shortly after. Yeah. It was a short-lived, and we saw um, we saw the year after we had that pretty big growth. Uh, we only gained about ninety-two to one hundred people the next year, so it wasn't a continued growth. But I do think there are reasons to think Vermont is a pretty attractive place to uh, bring people in uh, in the future. Uh, we are viewed somewhat as a climate haven, even though last summer's floods put a bit of a dent in that image. Uh, remote work is opening up more opportunities, and Vermont is just a pretty good place to live. I think a lot of people uh, value the quality of life. Um, so the state and uh, communities are trying to leverage those points. Uh, obviously, though, the big limitation, as always, is housing. And I think when we think of the uh, influx of people who came in during the pandemic, that put a lot of strain on our housing stock. I think that was a, one of the driving forces. So uh, communities are trying to grapple with how do we encourage people to move here, uh, but make sure we have places for them to live when they want to. Mm. Uh, and it's causing strain not just on, on schools, as we mentioned, not just on housing, but also on the labor market. Um, the, the very tight labor market in Vermont has made it hard for some companies to grow. Uh, can you talk a bit about that element of your reporting? Uh, did you speak to, to any business owners who are struggling to find people uh, younger than retirement age to work? I did, yeah. And, and yeah, this is really uh, the, the easiest way to understand this is that Vermont's population, the biggest cohort is the baby boom generation, and they are reaching retirement age. Uh, some are already there. And so as they retire out of the workforce, the generations behind them aren't as big. So that makes it a little hard to backfill their positions. And there are companies that are feeling that effects. I talked to a manufacturer in the Rutland area who, after a wave of retirements, has had to shift some of its production out of state. I also talked to uh, a general store in Bucks or in uh, Orwell, Buxton store. Many people probably know uh, the second generation owner there has been struggling to fill positions for years. Uh, and he he told us um, this used to be the sort of rite of passage for younger people to work here, and and it's not anymore. And and I think there are many factors that go into it beyond just aging population. I want to make clear that uh, this is also uh, just changes in the economy that are going to happen over time. I mean, uh, some we don't. We know about vacant jobs. We don't know, for example, what those jobs pay, what the benefits are. Mm. And so there are many reasons why companies might be struggling to hire. But I think that's only going to get harder as we have less people in the workforce. And the prediction is that our workforce or working age population is going to shrink. Uh, one wild card, I will say, is that people are working longer than they used to. And mm. that's uh, there's a lot of people who are working well past 65, whether because they need to or because they want to. And 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 I want to make very clear here that this isn't um, this isn't to say that older folks and the older population is a burden on society. Rather, uh, this is just to start a, a real, a, a sober look at our future and, and what are the challenges, but also what are the opportunities? I think that's one. Uh, older folks are a really important piece of the workforce and are going to be moving forward. And so the state and companies are thinking about how do we leverage that? How do we make jobs more flexible? Uh, and I think they're going to be doing that more and more. Mm.
We're speaking with Seven Days reporter Colin Flanders about his recent cover story called Getting On, an Aging Population is Transforming Vermont Schools, Workplaces, and Communities. Uh, let's go to the phones. We have Stacy in Morrisville on the line. Stacy, you're on the air. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm glad Colin just said that, that not looking at older people as a burden, as I am an older person. Um, and I just like to look at like more of the indigenous way of thinking about elders that most of us, at least, have gained a lot of wisdom and are helpful in other ways, even though we might not be in the so-called workforce. I think we're still valuable to the communities. So that's about all I was going to say. Oh, well, thank you, Stacy, for calling in. Uh, Colin, have you gotten similar feedback since your story came out? Totally, yeah. I've heard a lot of people saying the same thing, and I and I hear where that's coming from, and I think it's a great point. And uh, so we're working on a year-long series at Seven Days that's going to explore all of that. The challenge is also the benefits. I know seniors make up a big portion of our volunteer pool, and volunteers are vital to a lot of things in Vermont, uh, even caring for other seniors. I, I talked to a couple folks uh, in the NEK who are well into their 70s and uh, spend a lot of their day uh, visiting with m- vulnerable seniors who are maybe five, ten years older than them. And and that's to help cut down on isolation, which is a big risk. Uh, as people get older, they live alone, especially in rural areas. Um, so I, I, I totally hear where the caller's coming from, and I think that that's something I'm keeping in mind, too. I mean, I will say personally, I am very lucky all four of my grandparents are still alive. Uh, they're getting older, but they are, I mean, they're like some of the most meaningful people in my life, and they've had a big impact. And so uh, when you say wisdom, I think of my grandparents father who is is always uh filling me in on our history so uh, i think it's a big part of the series well if that hits home for you give us a call 800-639-2211 let's take one more caller we have robert and bethel on the line robert you're on the air go ahead hey mccullough and uh, colin this is a great uh, great show and colin has offered so much good information <clears throat> pardon my voice uh, you know i just want to announce you know i uh, there's a, a number of conversations that we could have, but there's an equilibrium problem. I call it the third rail in Vermont, and that is our property taxes, specifically to education. Eighty-five percent of our property taxes go directly to the supervisory unions. Our schools are pretty much empty, and the seniors are emptying out. So now we're going to come up, there's going to be a serious gap and um, I also wanted to say, regarding the workforce, I've interviewed with a number of companies. I'm 67, and I'm proud of it. It's amazing how the companies don't respond. They, uh, they don't communicate. I just took a position at a educational university, uh, kind of in Middlebury. I'm not going to say who it is. I have had the best experience working for that educational university I, I i seriously my friends are saying hey robert how's that going i said i've never ever been so impressed with the communication the culture the compassion to welcome a 67 year old guy to work in a kitchen and i just love it oh robert i'm so glad to hear that you've found that position for you robert seems like has lots of great ideas for for future topics for you colin eh? yeah totally and i will say the next uh what we're planning for the next part of the series is a closer look at the workforce and some of those conversations what are companies doing to make themselves more attractive to win people like robert over because yeah. uh if if you're struggling to hire workers there are workers out there especially seniors who who for whatever reason, want to continue working. And maybe in the past, they might have gotten a little nudge out the door to be replaced yeah. with a cheaper, cheaper, younger person. And I think that's changing the conversation a little bit. Yeah. Well, uh, Colin, I want to make sure that we we look outside of the boundaries of Vermont for just a moment while we have you. Um, NPR reports that by 2030, one in six people in the world will be age 60 or over. And I know that for your reporting, you you researched some other countries that have aging populations like Japan. What did you learn from that research that, that might be relevant to Vermont or might be you know a path that you go down in the future in your reporting? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I've, I've sort of explained Vermont is at the, the tip of the roller coaster of this, this yeah. aging demographic shift. And, and Japan is... Uh, 
years ahead of us. And so we can look to them to see what they're going through. And they have seen some pretty dramatic impacts. I mean, a lot of schools, thousands of schools have closed. Uh, some communities have shrunk from 10,000 to 500. Uh, they are trying to come up with new ways to leverage technology, including even in nursing homes. There's uh, there's this really powerful photo from Reuters about uh, a, a robotic dog that is sometimes used as a toy for people in nursing homes to huh. give them a little social socialization um, as dystopian as that might feel. Yeah. So they are really trying to figure out how to navigate this future. One thing I will say, the U.S. benefits from being a place where a lot of people want to come as migrants. Migration has helped stave off a lot of our population uh, shift uh, across the country. And in Japan, they're a little more resistant to immigration. Mm. So that's one lesson, I think. Um, another is just, yeah, trying to figure out ways not only to try to resist our uh, demographic shifts, but adapt. And I think that uh, that's where I'm really interested moving forward in the series is what are we doing to make Vermont a better place for seniors to live, knowing we're going to have more and more people fitting that description. So what are, uh, I, I'm really interested in Meals on Wheels. I know the Older Americans Act is up for renewal. Senator Sanders just had a, a big hearing about this um, last week. And so how are we making sure that seniors can afford to live here, can live safely, and can live out their twilight years at home? Mm. Well, speaking of uh, this look to other countries, places outside Vermont and the U.S., we got an email from a listener named Dean who writes, a perpetually increasing population is not sustainable. Some see a steady not increasing population as an opportunity for real economic and social strength. Zero population growth has already been attained in some northern European countries. Do you know if they are finding successful ways to adjust their economies and societies? Uh, have you wrestled with this idea of, of zero population growth? You know? So I don't know specifically about the countries uh, the writer is talking about, but I will say that that is, uh, yeah, that is a, a clear part of this conversation, especially when we're thinking about climate change and the impacts on the climate and how to reduce our uh, carbon footprint. Um, the idea of a fast-growing population feels like that's a tension there. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's a challenge because with birth rates where they are, for Vermont to even maintain a steady population, we need to be bringing people in here. Uh, last year alone, we we lost, we net lost about 1,000 to 1,200 people. And so times that by 20 years, that's a lot of people. Um, so it's you still need to try to find ways to bring people in. Uh, there are people out there who want to expand Vermont's population by 200,000. I think some people would. Uh, there's a bit of a sticker shock on that number, but I think there You're are You're talking Kevin Chu and the Vermont Futures That's project. right. Yeah. The Ver Kevin Chu, uh, there is this uh, idea that Vermont needs to dramatically grow its population to help offset some of the workforce impacts we've been talking about. But I do think there are opportunities and a need to bring people in. To Even just to maintain our population, we will need to attract more people. Mm. And if you want to learn more about what, what Colin's discussing right now, you can, of course, check out his article. We also interviewed Kevin Chu with the Vermont Futures Project here on Vermont Edition a couple months back. And we will link to that conversation in our show notes for today's show on vermontpublic.org. Um, and I'll also recommend the uh, Brave Little State podcast episode about why people leave Vermont. Uh, some really interesting conversations there. Uh, Colin Flanders, uh, what's coming next for you? You've mentioned about 400 stories that I think you and the Seven Days team want to work on. Uh, what's one thread that you're particularly excited to follow? Yeah, well, I, in addition to the workforce angle, one thing I'm yeah. really interested in is uh, caregiving and the mm -hmm. idea that a lot of families are going to be having a lot of tough conversations in the coming years about how do we best support our older family members, uh, including people who might be dealing with some sort of cognitive decline? How do we make sure that they can live safely? And there's a big burden on families right now, especially as our healthcare system struggles to keep pace. Uh, and so I'm interested in learning more about how families are adapting to that. What are those conversations like? And uh, I want to also obviously talk to older folks themselves about how they feel about aging uh, in Vermont, what the state could be doing better to support them. How do you make sure that this is a place you want to live? Colin Flanders with Seven Days. Thank you so much for your time and your reporting. Thanks for having me. In the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the Back to the Land movement boosted Vermont's population. 
Many of those young, adventurous people still live in Vermont and are now grandparents, and their demographic is a large and growing portion of the state's population. The median age in Vermont has jumped from 37 to 43 in the last two decades, making it the third oldest state in the country. That's putting a strain on certain services and programs, from the pension system to schools. For the rest of this hour, we're going to hone in geographically, at least, on Essex County. It's the old; It has the oldest median age in the state's 14 counties. One in three Essex County residents are over 60. It's also a very rural and sparsely populated area compared to the rest of the state. So when we're talking about those over 60 residents, we're talking just north of 2,000 people. A small population presents opportunities and challenges of its own. Now, joining me today is Meg Burmeister, the executive director for the Northeast Kingdom Council on Aging. They help seniors in the NEK through providing food and nutrition services, caregiver support, transportation, and much more. Meg, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. We're so glad you're with us. And we are also joined today by Sharon Eaton, the president of Lundenberg, Gilman, and Concord Senior Citizens. It's a nonprofit based in Gilman, Gilman, excuse me, and it oversees the Gilman Senior Center, which provides meals and other activities for connection for older residents in the area. Sharon, welcome. Thank you. We're happy to be here. Now, before we get to your organizations, I'm hoping you both can tell us a little bit about yourselves and and your connection to the communities in which you lived, how long you've lived there, and and your career trajectory. Uh, Meg Burmeister, let's start with you. Sure. I've been with the Council on Aging for almost eight years. Um, Prior to that, I worked at the Central Vermont Council on Aging for 11 years. So I've been working in this um, network of people supporting elders in our communities for quite some time. Um, I started at the Central Vermont Council on Aging as a social worker who was doing case management. And so that gave me a unique opportunity to kind of work my way through the ranks and really be sensitive to the things that we see in our community and going into people's homes and understanding their struggles and the individual and unique needs that people have as they age in place. Mm. And Sharon? I have been in Essex County for 35 years. I moved here with my husband and children in 1989 um, into a rural farming community. And over the years, um, we purchased a a farm of our own outside of Gilman, and we began a dog boarding and grooming business that became a nonprofit. That led to us being connected to the senior population, to the Gilman Senior Center, um, providing food for seniors for their animals, and then um, through them coming to the to the boarding and grooming for grooming for their pets. And from there, it kind of when our senior center here in uh, Gilman closed in 2019, it brought me to a place where I was absolutely horrified that there was no services in this area for our seniors. And so we began a journey to reopen one. Um, and that was very difficult because of the, the lack of places to put a senior center um, in, in Gilman or Lunaburg. So that's how I became. And I've been absolutely involved for just over two years. Robert in Burlington is on the line. Robert, you're on the air. Go ahead. So, so it's not exactly Essex County. It's That's like uh, right. kind of the opposite. <laughs> but um, so I'm. I guess I'm lucky. I, I'm. I'm unlucky in that I'm. I'm 68, but I'm kind of involuntarily retired. So I'm on low income. I'm on my Social Security and what I have in retirement. Um, but I'm lucky in that I own my home, and um, my and it's a humble home, and um, my taxes are actually for Burlington, pretty low. I'm paying maybe $300 a month in taxes. Uh, um, and uh, I, I, I just can't imagine 
what I would do if I if I was renting. I don't know how I would pay you know eighteen hundred or or two thousand dollars a month in rent uh, uh, um, if I were living in an apartment. And if I was then if I had to go out to the boondock, say in Essex County in the Northeast Kingdom, uh, I don't I I don't know how I would get along in the isolation if I if I wasn't close enough to getting, you know, to a grocery store to get food. And if I wasn't, um, and I, if I didn't have the services that I have in the city of mm. Burlington, uh, I, to me, that, that is a conundrum mm. that Vermont has. Yeah. Well, Robert, thank you so much for your call and for highlighting those issues that are experienced, not just in more rural parts of the state, but in places like Burlington as well. And I'd love to hear both of our guests' thoughts on on what you brought up, Robert. Uh, Meg Burmeister, the executive director with the Northeast Kingdom Council on Aging. Um, A lot to pull apart here. Let's start with what Robert brought up about um, wondering what it would be like for somebody who is living alone in a rural area, being able to access the services they need and, and not just complex services but things like you know going to the grocery store and getting food uh, how does that play out in your work so for us we see that playing out all the time um we have a s- senior helpline that really um is the first point of entry for people uh, that's a statewide number that all the area agencies on aging utilize um but we utilize volunteers and help make connections with our transportation system with the rct program in in our three county area that help people get to grocery shopping and be able to um get their needs met and of course that relies on volunteers and the older americans act i think colin talked about the reauthorization coming up it's a really it was a groundbreaking Um, piece of legislation in the 1960s that relied heavily on volunteers to be able to support elders in the community. So if it's getting a ride or getting grocery shopping done, um, we do have the means to help people with that. But we also face the the challenges uh, that COVID left for all of us in terms of people who were volunteering, deciding to stop volunteering, and then really have focused efforts for the last several years on on rebuilding that network for ourselves. Mm. Sharon, do you, do you also rely on volunteers to connect with Vermonters who are, who are living in more isolated areas? We do. And we're just now starting to reestablish a strong volunteer base. And it's difficult. It's very, very difficult um, because a lot of our volunteers are seniors themselves. And so, you know, sometimes they can help and Sometimes they just can't, but, you know, we now have a place that they can reach out to for help, um, and we can then direct them to the area on aging. Sometimes they don't know to go there, Um, and so it's a lot of us do things for our seniors in our communities just because we know them and we know they need help. So um, us being connected to the area on aging and really understanding what they offer has been a boon for our community Hmm. because before we just didn't know. Hmm. So, you know, and our Meals on Wheels program is, is doing amazing things. Robert also brought up um, isolation, um, and and let's talk about that. Not just in the sense of you know being able to access services, but having those emotional connections with people. I know a lot of uh, older people in Essex County and across the state live alone. Uh, Meg, let let's start with you. What are some of the ways in which um, you see isolation and loneliness affecting uh, seniors in your region, and what what is available to support them. So that's certainly through the pandemic that was raised to be one of the most significant issues that people were struggling with, the isolation and loneliness. Um, We have a a couple of volunteer opportunities where people can um, spend time visiting with somebody or can be part of the Telefriend program so that there is regular communication to connect with people. Um, In these last two years, we've also had a grant uh, that we call Technology for Today, which helps people work with their connectivity issues and 
um, being able to be a part of families again and, and using different apps to connect with family members. So we're kind of using modern technology to help people really um, stay connected and, and connected with friends and family, whether that be through social media um, or direct emails, et cetera. Hmm. So that's a really nice opportunity for people to have connections in different ways. And then part of what I'm sure Sharon will talk about is the home delivered meals program. It's not just a meal, it's a connection with a person and somebody doing a wellness check as they're dropping off your meal. And they often develop really wonderful friendships and relationships because they get to know each other. Hmm. Yeah, sure. What do you need to keep that program going and thriving? We um, we work every single day, <laughs> excuse me, we work every single day to make sure that every senior who needs something <clears throat> is getting it. And our, we, our drivers, um, our delivery folks, they are closely connected to every one of these people. And so just having somebody to say good morning, um, you know, and what can we do to help you is is so very important to every uh, family that is shut. Um, you know, it's, it's that light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and we've seen that grow um, since we've been back in a building, we've seen more people reaching out. I don't know if that's because it's becoming more more out there or if um, people are just now saying, okay, we can do this and there's no stigmatism attached to it. Hmm. Um, and, and in a lot of cases with seniors, they feel um, like they're uh, taking advantage of the system if they ask for this help. Hmm. So, you know, it's, it's an amazing program. And, um, you know, we're so happy to be able to provide that for them. Hmm. Well, Could good. I just add another comment? Please, Meg, go ahead. Sure. Mm -hmm. And one of the other ways that we support people in terms of isolation and loneliness is our case management system and options counseling. So we have workers that are able to go out to people's homes and help them explore what kinds of choices and what kinds of options they have before them. And that really gets down to the very individual challenges that people face and looks at their unique situations to help them understand what would be helpful. So we try very hard not to take a one size fits all approach with our work with people in the community. Well, let's take a one call before we have to go to break. We'll go to Wendy in Middlesex. Wendy, you're on the air. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Hi. I um, have a background in gerontology from UVM. I am 64 and have just been through aging nightmares with both my folks. Um, I had the privilege of living in Denmark, and so I know how other models can be. And in light of the housing crisis we face for everyone and the daycare crisis we face for everyone and the affordability, et cetera, et cetera, I just really, and it always comes down to money and funding, but I just urge all of us to sort of press our government and whoever is able to fund new models because our house, you know, if we could, if we could find a new way to create housing and help each other, um, it would it would eliminate loneliness and it would help everyone in the long run. Mm -hmm. So funding new models and continuing to do what we do well um, in Vermont would be great. Mm. And speaking of funding new models, we received an email from Linda who writes, I'm a 74-year-old living independently and alone in Burlington. I'd love to move to a smaller one-level home, but there's very little available. I'd like to see the state address this housing void and work with developers to build more small homes. Many roads leading back to the housing crisis here as part of our conversation on Vermont's aging population. Meg, 
like you mentioned earlier that you worked for many years uh, at the your kind of counterpart agency in central Vermont. Now you work primarily in Essex County and in the Northeast Kingdom at large. What are some of the differences that you've noticed um, for for older Vermonters who are living in uh, in the Northeast Kingdom compared to central Vermont? Or are all the issues uh, and challenges that they face generally the same? I think the thing that comes to mind first off is the Northeast Kingdom and Essex County are unique um, because of the rural nature of this part of the state. It requires people to be resourceful. And so for many, it really requires some imaginative thinking and ability to step outside the box in helping reach out to neighbors and, and care for one another. Um, I think when you have less people to to be around other people, um, we tend to look to our neighbors and we tend to look to our townspeople for support. And I don't know that we see that as much in some of the larger um, or more urban areas, if you will. Mm. So it's one of the special qualities of the Northeast Kingdom, the willingness of agencies to work together and the willingness of people to come together. We are always touched by putting out uh, posts for volunteer opportunities and the amount of people that come forward and are glad to help and jump in. And uh, you, Sharon, you've lived in uh, in Gilman in the area for, for decades now. At, on today's show, we've been talking a lot about how Vermont's population is not just uh, getting older, but it's getting older pretty quickly compared to other places in the country. Have you noticed that shift in Essex County on the grand uh, on the ground over the course of of your life there? I have. When we moved here, we were, you know, all all young. Our children were in the school systems. Um, in the sports system. And, um, you know, we all kind of have grown old together. And now our children are uh, adults and very few of those children still live in Essex County. Our, our parents and um, are here a, a lot, um, but they're older now. And so our children have, they might still be in the area, but they're not in Essex County. So our school population is decreasing. Um, our young people are, are decreasing. And our, you know, our school system has now become part of the state's uh, situation. And our children, we only have a, you know, we're, all of the children are you know, now going toward Linden. And so the young people have, have moved away mm. mostly. And, and it's, very, it's very hard uh, because a lot of those seniors, their, their children who are in their 40s and 50s have made new lives elsewhere. So there's not a lot of support for the the seniors, you know, um, other than a phone call a week or what have you. So it's it has rapidly changed hmm. here. What 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 do we do to 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 bring more young people into Essex County or or back in? Is, is that the goal, Meg? I I don't okay. know. Oh, uh, Meg, I'd love for you to weigh in here as well. You know, I think that we have to get out of the mindset of um, almost telling our younger people to leave. Um, mm. So in some respects, that makes it hard for people to see a future for themselves and remain in the area. Mm. Um, we do have supporting ways of helping people try to um, reach out and, and, and be employed and, and work on workforce challenges that we see all the time in terms of caregiving support and um, people to provide 
the in-home care that the Choices for Care program, for example, offers. Um, but it needs to be a well-rounded, well-thought-out plan of how do we support and encourage people to remain in their communities and remain in the Northeast Kingdom, particularly Essex County, so that we continue to develop um, both the workforce and the desire for people to stay. Hmm. Well, let's go back to the phones. We have Jennifer in Lyme, New Hampshire on the line. Jennifer, you're on the air. Go ahead. Oh, thank you for taking my call. Yes. What are your thoughts on the conversation? Well, um, the question that I had is actually on behalf of my brother and sister-in-law mm-hmm. who own a home in Rygate, Vermont. They're a little younger than myself, but they are in their early 60s. They have a son, my nephew, who is a young adult. He's about 25, 26. He has Down syndrome and is autistic. So while my brother continues to work, his wife pretty much has to hold the bag and stay at home with their son uh, because he is not uh, able to be independent. So my concern is about those aging parents who have dependents of their own and what's going to happen to them when they can no longer care for them, when they, they need care for themselves and there's no option for their Down syndrome son to be in, say, a group home or something. There's There's really nothing in Vermont to support uh, individuals like that. Mm. So I think that's one of their big concerns going forward. They, it's not an immediate concern, but down the road, they're going to have to figure something out. Mm. Yeah. Jennifer, thank you for your question. Uh, Meg, I'm I'm curious if there there are any supports uh, like the type that, that Jennifer's family members need. Well, part of the supports are through the um, developmental disabilities um, workforce and, and, and group um, programs that that provide support for people, and and in Vermont, we're moving into a, a more um, a federally mandated rule around conflict free case management, and the hope is that that will also help bolster some creativity and exploring other options. Um, we see a number of older families caring for. Uh, disabled children. And that's a a conversation that's really unique and individual to help understand what the family wants for their loved one and then how to implement and plan for that to occur. And I think uh, one of the comments earlier that Colin had made um, is we need the funding to be able to provide the resources and the options available. We need funding and housing so that there's appropriate independent living options um, that are not so cost prohibitive that it really eliminates the average everyday person from being able to afford them. So it's putting on our creative hats to ensure that we do the planning we need to do with people, but that we also have the resources available. And as we talk about what your organizations need, uh, Sharon Eaton, what what does the Gilman Senior Center need, either from the community or from the the state larger umbrella organizations, to keep doing the work it's doing to support seniors in your region? In in our area, we need first of all um, funding is is huge here. Um, It's a small, poor, poor community. Um, So local funding is not really, um, it doesn't really happen here. Um, You know, a few thousand dollars comes in on on donations. Um, We do a lot of grant writing here. The area on aging, um, having them help us uh, support our meal site and, and our Meals on Wheels program, help us keep it going. But that's our biggest um, thing here is is funding um, volunteers, um, young people, young energetic people who want to be a part of helping the the seniors in in our area that those things are the biggest thing that we bump up against here 
um, housing, once again, we're in that housing thing because it's hard. Young people can't find really housing here. Um, so it's it's all a giant circle um, in wrapped in around funding and volunteering and housing and um, the the many, many seniors and shut-ins um, living in a rural com community. So that's what we need here mm. are you know funding and help. Meg. What do you need to do the best work you can at the Northeast Kingdom Council on Aging? I think we have to realize that nothing in life is free and that <laughs> um, that we really need additional funding to be able to support the meals programs for the entire state. Um, the When we do a meal cost analysis, we're paying roughly two thirds of the meal cost um, of what it actually costs to put a meal on the uh, out for a meal site. And that becomes very difficult for organizations that are running um, on the on the heels of volunteers um, who are on their boards and who are keeping these meal sites open and available. But the funding has not increased to keep up with things like the food costs that have occurred and the challenges that people face in terms of supply and demand. Um, and, and being able to access resources so that they could get cheaper um, products so they can make sure that the meals are there for people. Mm. Well, Meg Burmeister, the Executive Director for the Northeast Kingdom Council on Aging, thank you so much for joining our conversation today. Thank you for having us. You're also joined by Sharon Eaton, the president of Ludenberg Gilman and Concord Senior Citizens. It's a nonprofit that oversees the Gilman Senior Center. Sharon, thank you so much for your time and your perspective as well. Thank you.